Okay, Mustafa. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Welcome and thank you all for joining us today, uh, whether you are here at Cornell or anywhere in the world. Uh, my name is Mustafa Minawi and I'm the Director of Critical Ottoman and Post-Ottoman Studies, COPOS, and an Associate Professor in the History Department here at Cornell University. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge that Critical Ottoman and Post-Ottoman Studies is part of the Ainaudi Center at Cornell University here in Ithaca, New York. And it is from here that I'm speaking to you right now. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayoko Ono uh, Nation or the Cayuga Nation. The Gayoko Ono uh, are members of an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy uh, precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and indeed the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of the Kayoko Ono dispossession and honor the ongoing connections of Kayoko Ono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. A little bit about critical Ottoman and post Ottoman studies. Um, the, the mission of our uh, COPOS is to feature the latest in research from around the world um, uh, about Southwest Asia, North Africa, and Southeastern Europe and their connections to the wider region. The goal here is to establish Cornell University as the hub uh, for innovation and critical studies which challenge traditional understanding of this part of the world. From the study of history of various parts of the Ottoman Empire to critical policy analysis of contemporary re of the contemporary region, um, such as um, what we're going to get into it for today, we aim to give a platform for scholars, artists, activists, and practitioners with new and rarely discussed approaches to the study of the dynamic region, which lies at the center of the Afro-Eurasia continent. In today's event. Um, uh, we will discuss the world of policy consulting with two historians who have taken alternative paths with their careers after getting their PhDs, uh, Professor Howard Eisenstadt and Dr. Nicholas uh, Danforth. Soon, we'll also be featuring scholars that you will need to know on our website, scholars who are doing cutting edge research, pushing the study of the field beyond the traditional paradigms. In short videos, we are calling five and 15 to be posted on our website over the next few weeks. Uh, we will also be announcing our schedule of events for spring 2022 on our website. If you would like to keep in touch with us, uh, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So stay tuned and sign up for our social uh, in our social media um, and or check us out on our website. I would like to thank Pamela Hampton and uh, Courtney Sop as always for uh, helping me put this together. I would also like to thank the Mario Ainadi Center for International Studies for their steadfast support of COPOS and particularly this uh, session today, which is uh, part of a series called Beyond Tenure Track Professionalization Series. I would also like to thank our co-sponsors, the Society for the Humanities, the Cornell, uh, the Department of History, and the Department of Near Eastern Studies. Now, I would like to turn to our guest speakers. Uh, they will talk for about 15 to 20 minutes each, then we will open it up to questions. You can type your questions uh, into the Q&A tab uh, at any time, and we will do our best to get to all of them if we can. We are also very lucky today to have my colleague, Professor uh, Durba Ghosh. Durba, uh, Dr. Ghosh is a professor of history and the director of the Humanities Scholars Program. She is the author of Sex and the Family in Colonial India, The Making of Empire, which was published by Cambridge uh, University Press in 2006 and Gentlemanly Terrorists, Political Violence and the Colonial State in India, 1919 to 1947, also published by Cambridge in 2017. Her next project emerges from the Gentlemanly Terrorists and considers how we commemorate national heroism in the post-colony. Now I will turn it over to Professor Ghosh and leave you in her capable hands. Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. And uh, I think a huge thank you to Mustafa Manawi for bringing us all together this afternoon. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be able to welcome our two guests. 
Uh, I'm also really pleased at how many of you are able to join us here in upstate New York. As you can see from the background of Professor Manawi's um, office window, uh, it's a wintry day um, and it almost seems like we're in New York City on the Today program, but in fact, we're in Ithaca, New York. Um, I want to just give a shout out to folks who are graduate students or postgraduate fellows who are looking for positions. We are also holding another event co-sponsored by History and the Society for the Humanities about careers in academic publishing, and that's Tuesday, December 7th, and you'll be seeing um, notices about that. But first, I want to start by introducing our first speaker, uh, Nicholas Danforth. Nicholas Danforth is the author of the book, The Remaking of Republican Turkey, Memory and Modernity Since the Fall of the Ottoman Empire. He has covered U.S.-Turkish relations for the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy, the German Marshall Fund of the United States, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and the Bipartisan Policy Center. Dr. Danforth received his MA from the School of Oriental and African Studies and his bachelor's degree from Yale. He completed his PhD in history at Georgetown University in 2015, and he has written widely about Turkey, US foreign policy, and the Middle East for publications that include The Atlantic, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, The New York Times, War on the Rocks, and The Washington Post. With that introduction, I wanna turn it over to Nick. All right, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, very much appreciate the kind introduction from both of you. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk about this, hopefully say something uh, constructive that will be of value to people. Uh, Howard and I were discussing this before the panel and we were both, we were both trying to fight the temptation to be too pessimistic. So I will, uh, I will do that. And I actually don't, the temptation is not too overwhelming. I think there are actually some things to be optimistic about. They just have to be couched with enough caveats. Um, the good news basically is that there are a lot of uh, phenomenal jobs in the policy world, a lot of phenomenal jobs in Washington. Uh, a number of my colleagues from my PhD program um, have gotten those jobs, are very happy with those jobs. Uh, so in that sense, you know, that's the part that I think is the good news. That's the optimistic side of it. The somewhat discouraging part is that there actually, you know, I say there are a lot of those jobs, that's all relative. There aren't, there still aren't a huge number of those jobs. They're still very difficult to get. Um, and I would offer all the advice I have with the kind of caveat that again, you know, there aren't a huge number of those jobs and I'm not really even fully sure how I got any of them and what the best way to get them is. You know, I mean, I basic, my background is that after finishing my PhD, you know, I probably applied to 30 academic jobs and got none of them. And have subsequently applied to 30 non-academic policy jobs and gotten like one and a half of them. So in that sense, I mean, I have been much more successful in this realm, but it is all relative. Uh, the advice, if I had to, or I guess I do have to, that's why I'm here, in thinking about how to uh, crystallize the advice I would give on this subject, what I would say is that to the extent, and maybe this is obvious, to the extent you really want a policy job, that will increase your odds of getting it. To the extent you see it purely as a backup plan, purely as something to do, if you can't get a tenure track job, that is obviously going to work against you. That's going to make it harder to get. Um, I mean, and part of that is, you know, unfortunately, there are trade offs and there's a degree of prioritization that is necessary. Um, you know, as I said, there are a number of very good jobs in the policy world. Um, a lot of them, you know, a lot of them don't require a PhD at all. The number that require a PhD or for which a PhD is an asset is actually a relatively small subset of those jobs. And of those, you know, where a PhD is necessary, the quality of your PhD actually doesn't matter very much at all. Uh, and so with that, my real advice would be that if you are interested in a policy non-tenure track job, that really whatever stage of your PhD you're at, you know, my advice would be to start 
focusing on the things that will enable you to get a policy job. And that, unfortunately, I think often comes at the expense of you know, completing the kind of PhD that would make you more competitive for academic jobs. Um, you know, in my own experience, I, the last probably two years that I was working on my dissertation, I spent uh, a lot of time trying to write, you know, policy pieces for a um, policy audience. Um, it took up an enormous amount of time and effort that all came at the expense of working on my dissertation. Uh, it resulted in a dissertation that was not as good as it otherwise would have been. Um, my sense looking back is if I hadn't done all the extra writing, if I prioritized my dissertation, I still wouldn't have gotten an academic job and I wouldn't have gotten the job in the policy world that I ended up getting. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, so that unfortunately I think is the, the essence of it that at a certain point, um, that kind of prioritization, in my experience at least, is necessary. Um, building on that, you know, and or just taking a step back from that, there are a lot of things you can do in the course of, you know, the final years of your PhD program um, that take more or less amounts of time, but that I do think go a long way in opening up doors in uh, the policy world. Um, you know, there are some obvious, I'd encourage anyone who's kind of interested in this to apply for the State Department. It's, you know, a lot of people have phenomenal careers there. They love it. The they, you know, it is one of the organizations that, despite some issues in the pandemic, continues to hire people, hires very good people. Um, but it's a really long process. Uh, and it's actually, it's not super time consuming until the end. So it is something that, you know, two years to go until you finish your PhD, you put in an application for the State Department. And you know, with luck, by the time that's coming to fruition, it will be right as you're finishing up. Um, and that's a lot better than finishing, realizing you want to apply for the State Department and then still having to wait two years for the entire application process uh, and your security clearance. The other, what was the, I mean, the other thing I think that is very, or is relatively easy to do that goes a long way is trying to publish for you know at least one or two pieces for a non-academic audience. Uh, and there are an increasing number of excellent venues in which to do that. Uh, and I think even doing one or two things, you know, one or two articles is really useful only in that there's not, I think sometimes people have an exaggerated sense of the kind of skepticism that people in the policy world have about people in the academic world. And I think sometimes that comes from a kind of defensiveness or an assumption uh, amongst people in Washington that people in the academic world are looking down at them. So they respond by kind of being a little extra prickly in assuming, you know, maybe assuming a degree of suspicion or, you know, something that doesn't exist. But I actually think what's really useful about writing even just one or two articles for policy audience is that kind of, it's like a proof of concept. It disarms that. You're saying, you know, it's, I'm not, I'm not too good to write for a policy audience. I'm not, I'm interested in trying to write clearly. I'm interested in trying to convey ideas to a broader audience. You know, which in my experience, most academics are, but you sort of have to demonstrate that to people, I think. Um, and it, we can go into more detail about this um, later on in the discussion, but you know, there's the Washington Post has uh, Made by History, which is it's, you know, a blog that specifically caters to historians trying to write about. Um, contemporary Issues, it publishes a lot of phenomenal stuff. Uh, War on the Rocks, the publication I've worked for as an editor is always very eager to get stuff from academics, um, you know, in particular people who haven't necessarily published for a policy audience before and is eager to work with them to try to make their ideas uh, accessible to a broader audience. Again, we can talk about more things, but there are, there are very good options out there and it's worth, um, I think it's worth taking advantage of them. Uh, and then I know Howard has more thoughts about this, but there is, you know, as with everything, networking is important, trying to at least kind of get to know, become familiar with uh, people who are working in the policy world. Uh, I actually think Twitter is a phenomenal place to do that. There are a lot of, you know, it is where all policy people, all journalists are having a lot of conversations. A lot of those people, I think, genuinely are interested in hearing from academics. And to the extent in a kind of 
uh, constructive, enthusiastic way that you can use Twitter as a place to have conversations with those people. Um, it's a really, it's a valuable place to do it. You can, uh, you know, promote your work if you do write things, you know, especially in kind of more mainstream publications, but even blog posts um, that you think would be of interest. It's a way to share them. People will see them. People will read them. Um, and it, yeah, it makes you part of a conversation in a way that I think does help um, in the long run. The final thing I would say, this is more, I'm kind of, I'm curious what uh, Howard or anyone else thinks about this. It's more just something I've been interested in as, you know, I've thought about this whole issue. And I, you know, I do think, I think it's worth emphasizing that the, despite what sometimes people think, the ideological range, the kind of spectrum of acceptable viewpoints that you're allowed to have in, Washington and the policy community in the United States State Department ends up being much broader than people think. Uh, it may still not be broad enough to encompass everyone's views. And there are certainly views that are taboo that you know, will get you in trouble and undermine your career prospects if you express. But you know, I think it is worth emphasizing that you know, there are a lot of people with pretty uh, progressive, you know, what in other contexts would be characterized as anti-American views. Um, you can be very liberal, you can be relatively outspoken, and still, you know, there are career options. Um, I don't know if anyone saw the, um, the book Susie Hansen published a couple years ago, that very critical uh, book, fun read, um, really taking issue with the entire legacy of U.S. foreign policy. I've been amazed to see how many people I meet in the State Department who love that book. Um, you know, again, that doesn't mean there aren't views that you would, you know, potentially get in trouble for. Um, I guess the way I'd summarize it, you know, you can think that the United States has done a lot of really evil things in its history. You can't think the United States is fundamentally evil. You do sort of have to believe that there's a potential for the United States to do good things in the world that, you know, being part of the system, trying to reform the system from within is a valuable endeavor. Um, but you can come at that from a lot of places. Um, I guess the way I'd summarize it is, you know, you can be, you can be Bernie Sanders, you can't be one of the people who criticizes Bernie Sanders from the left for being a sellout. You can say that the legacy of US foreign policy in Latin America has been brutal, has been catastrophic. You can condemn, you know, what Trump was doing in Venezuela. You can't celebrate Maduro as a kind of hero of the anti-imperial resistance. That's that's kind of where I would draw the line. And it's actually, it's fun to watch, not, not even as Bernie as much, but his uh, foreign policy advisor, Matt Duss on Twitter. I think he does a very good job of kind of demarcating where the outer limit of what's sort of, I don't know, kind of mainstream, not mainstream, but acceptable uh, within the current formulation of DC policy thinking. Um, and it's, a, you know, that's changing in interesting ways, um, especially in regard to Israel, and we can talk about that. But it's certainly, yeah, it's, I think it's worth keeping in mind that, you know, I, in my experience, at least, it was more ideological diverse than I expected. Um, I may have more to say. That's all I can remember that I was going to say. So I will turn this over to Howard now. And yeah, look forward to discussing this further in the questions. Right. Thank you so much, Nick. That was super helpful. So um, I've taken some notes, which I'll maybe summarize at the end for folks uh, who weren't able to take notes. But first, I'll introduce Howard. Um, Howard Eisenstadt is an, is an associate professor of history at St. Lawrence University in upstate New York, so further upstate than us. His scholarship focuses on the relationship between religious and national identity in the late Ottoman contemporary and modern Turkey, the late Ottoman Empire and in contemporary modern Turkey. He's also done additional work in contemporary Turkish politics and international relations. Professor Eisenstadt received his PhD in 2006 from UCLA and after that served as a Turkey country specialist for Amnesty International between 2006 and 2017. He was a primary author of the Turkey section of the Freedom House Annual Report from 2018 to 2020. 
His current research is on the place of non-Muslims in Turkish policy and politics since 1980. Let's try this being very professorial and, and uh, uh, having myself muted when I start. Uh, thanks so much for, for, for having me and, and, and uh, great to be with Nick on this. And, and I can only say that I wish this sort of event was being held when I was in graduate school. It would have been very useful for me. Um, I, I have to say, I kind of, I guess I had a sense that I might want to do policy work uh, in addition to academics, I was sort of um, at a happier historical moment, uh, maybe not in the history of the Middle East, but in the history of historians of the Middle East in that I graduated a few years earlier than Nick. And so the job market was, was friendlier. Um, I was less worried about getting a position, though I, I, I sensed even then that the door to, to academic positions was closing. And um, uh, that that uh, timing would matter. Um, a lot of what I've done professionally has basically been a reflection of you know sort of my my personal values uh, and and sort of political concerns. Uh, when I did my dissertation research in Turkey, and I sort of stretched out uh, my time there because. Istanbul is more pleasant to me than than most other places, and and I could write and and live in Istanbul uh, relatively easily. I I uh, allocated one day a week to working with migrants and refugees, um, at, at a purely volunteer basis, uh, and I continued that that sort of voluntary work in the public sphere. Uh, when I came back and I, I worked for Amnesty, the, those those years at Amnesty were were all volunteer years, um, and you know sort of went alongside my academic career. And and like Nick, it probably didn't do great things for my my publishing record. Uh, it's I mean in the end we only have so many hours in a day, so many days in a week, and so. Uh, you know, I don't regret that time, but there are costs to it. And, and it had to do with, you know, sort of how I wanted to balance uh, different parts of my professional life. Um, what I think happened uh, in uh, 20, 2013 or so was that my work in Turkish human rights which I had sort of gotten into because I felt like people weren't talking about it enough because I felt like uh, the, particularly the policy discussions in Washington were, were not addressing it. Uh, it. It meant that I had already uh, created a sort of public persona for myself as someone who worked on Turkish human rights when the rest of the world decided that Turkish human rights were, were an issue in, uh, during the Gezi uh, protests in 2013. Uh, in other words, you know, sort of, I started getting invited to things. Uh, in fact, it's where, where we met, uh, where I met Nick in, in 2013 was at one of these events. I started getting invited to events because I had already been doing the work on it for, you know, almost a decade previous and was, was, therefore sort of Johnny on the spot. Um, that has opened up a lot of opportunities to me. I, I've, I'm a tenured professor. I'm glad to be a tenured professor. I like being in the classroom. I like doing regular scholarship, but I, I think that I've, I've benefited a lot from my experience in the policy world. Uh, I think it has, um, it has allowed me to talk to different people. It has uh, honed my skill at talking to people who uh, disagree with me fundamentally on a whole series of, of broader issues. I, I think that Nick's uh, absolutely right that in many ways, um, the policy world is um, more, 
has a wider range of sort of political views than than sort of most academic conversations that I've been in, at least. Um, the uh, it it is a world that is anxious for new ideas, uh, so long as they're communicated efficiently and effectively. Um, I think you know thinking about sort of. And I thought about making the transition to, to a, a pure policy world. I think that that uh, the types of jobs that Nick is talking about in think tanks, those are really rare jobs. There's only, at a wild guess, there's only about 20 people working full time on Turkey in Washington that, you know, aren't in an academic position. Uh, the... Uh, but there's a, a whole range of other types of jobs, uh, you know, in the various uh, aspects of the government, in uh, uh, in NGOs, where that sort of expertise can be really valued. Certainly, Amnesty, when I worked for them, really valued my input not just as somebody who who cared about human rights, but as a scholar. Um, I think the the trick is not so much like what you personally believe, but, and, and here's where I think I would nuance uh, Nick's, uh, Nick's arguments a little bit differently. Um, I think it's about the extent to which you're comfortable working for institutions and the, the extent to which you're willing to bow to uh, the, the dictates of the institution in your public performance. Uh, there were many times over the years that I disagreed with uh, with Amnesty when I was working for Amnesty, when, uh, with uh, the Project on Middle East Democracy when I worked with them. There were many times that, that I didn't agree with sort of the way they were framing things or I wanted them to cover different issues or I was simply cynical about the efficacy of what they were doing. And... Um, you know, if you're going to work with an institution, if you're going to to carry that institution's imprimatur, then you really have to uh, you have to to uh, be willing and able to to accept those limits on what you say. Um, I think so. So I I think that there are jobs out there. Uh, I think that mostly mostly the big catch, at least. From my cohort, the big catch uh, is not whether one can find a job with a PhD. Uh, the big catch is the extent to which you're willing to um, buy into the institutional uh, goals, the institutional mission uh, of uh, of the places that you're applying to. If in the end uh, you think that that you know U.S. foreign policy is is inherently bankrupt, then the State Department's probably not a great place for you. Um, if uh, you you can't continence being uh, part of uh, security structures, then then you know don't apply to the CIA. I think that there are a lot of smart, very progressive people who work in both of those institutions, but you know they have to they have to recognize who they're working for and 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 be okay with it. Um, really, what what I wanted to to highlight is is how much I've gotten professionally and personally from uh, the my engagement with the policy world. Uh, it has made me, I think, I hope, a a better public speaker. Which you know, admittedly, it, it was a low starting point. So so take that for what it is. Um, it's made me a much more effective writer. Uh, it has taught me the value of uh, talking to people uh, about issues that don't necessarily have my same same starting places. It, it was, you know, when if you're lobbying for amnesty, as I I did uh, on many occasions, uh, then you go into Democratic and Republican uh, offices. Uh, uh, and and try to make the best case you can, and you know their position on other issues is not is not really sort of your bellwick. 
Um, I think that that uh, the DC community can be really welcoming, especially if you're not competing for their jobs. I I, I think you know there there are a very limited number of of jobs in the think tank world, and it, it, it's always felt to me, and maybe Nick can can speak to this uh, uh, more, uh, more effectively. It's always seemed to me that 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 competition was polite, but also pretty aggressive. Um, I've always felt really welcomed sort of ecumenically. And I think part of that is that I'm not a threat to, to the people involved. I, I, I'm not going to tr try to get their job. I, I'm not jealous of their job. And which means that they can bring me in. I can do my, do my thing, make my contributions, sort of be friends with everybody, and then go back home to, to upstate New York. Um, I think if you're, if I were trying to get a job in the policy world, I would have to move to DC right now. Um, I think that uh, geographic proximity is a huge deal in finding these jobs. Um, and uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, Nick was talking about Twitter. I, I'm not a big social media person. The reason that I use Twitter is because I live 14 miles from the Canadian border. And if I, if I want to, to um, bring ideas to the attention of others, I can't do it over coffee. I have to do it electronically. And, I'm, and sort of I, I, when I use social media, I'm very aware that it's a public persona. So, so you know, Nick's point, uh, I agree with. That, that social media can be a powerful tool for sort of getting ideas out. But I would, uh, I would argue that uh, you, you, want to be, uh, you want to be productive uh, in, in the sense of bringing forward uh, data, information, new ideas, uh, and um, not get caught in the, the sort of troll fest, slug fest aspects of social media, which, you know, if, if I were, if I were a graduate advisor and I had a student who is, uh, who is doing that, I, I would tell them to stop because, because I, I don't think that that it's wise, particularly early in your career, to to make enemies. Um, you never know who's going to be on a grants committee. You never knew, know who's going to be on a hiring committee. Um, and I guess that goes to, to what I would say is the final professional point. And it, it's, um, I'm, I'm somebody who, who comes out of I mean, a, a family tradition where vigorous debate was the norm uh, and typically undertaken at loud volume. Um, I, I, I guess academics, lots of people come from that sort of family. But, uh, the best piece of professional advice I got was, was from my dissertation advisor, Jim Galvin, uh, which was simply to be kind. And I have found it to be invariably, I mean, it's, it's good karma, it's, good, it's a good thing generally, it's really good professional advice. Uh, people are typically um, really willing to help if you ask for it honestly if you're doing good work, and they typically have really long memories for slights. And I think being kind to those, both those who sort of are sort of ahead of you and those people who are behind you and you want to help pull up is, is just sort of the best basic uh, advice that I could possibly give. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna start with be kind. Yes, please be kind. <laughs> um, so I have a couple of thoughts and, and maybe I'll um, pose some questions. For those of you in the audience, please do post your questions in the Q&A. Um, maybe I'll go backward, uh, Howard, and start with be kind. So. I can see who's participating today, but I don't know what your particular circumstance is. But one thing I will say 
from my own experience of finishing a PhD and going into a job market that seemed uncertain then is even more uncertain now, um, is that uh, it's very, very easy to, to feel resentful and it's very easy to feel um, that there aren't opportunities for you. Um, but one thing I think is really important is to think about what opportunities you want to embrace, because I do think there's a logic on the PhD job market, which creates certain kinds of hierarchies of which are very desirable jobs and which are less desirable. Um, and also some of these hierarchies translate to academic jobs versus non-academic jobs. But one thing I think is really important, and I say this as somebody who thought I was not gonna be an academic and actually trained for a very different job, um, that I think it's really important uh, to choose. And so I wanna just address something else that Howard, you brought up, which is geographical considerations may be important to you, right? So that whether you wanna to apply to a think tank or work in the policy world, work in the State Department, um, being aware of what the geographical demands are might be something to think about. The same is true actually for academic jobs, right? So. I have a PhD in South Asian history. And when I was on the job market, there really weren't that many jobs in different parts of the country, right? Most of the jobs were in urban centers. I think that's different. And I think it's really important to think about those geographic considerations. Um, I think one of the things that Howard, you said was to think about the institutional mission, right? And in this kind of imagined academic hierarchy, R1 institutions are seen to be the pinnacle of this mountain, right? And for any of you thinking that I'm getting fabulously wealthy working here, I have a bridge I could sell you. But the really important thing is to align yourself with the institutional mission. And I think that's really a very um, good thing to think about, right? Could you work for the State Department? Could you work for the CIA? Could you work for Amnesty International? Um, but also just thinking a little bit about the different kinds of institutions that we work for. So I, um, before I came to Cornell, taught actually women's colleges for five years where I felt a real strong purpose and sense of institutional mission. Um, think a little bit about what would bring you satisfaction in terms of those institutional missions. Um, I have very close friends from graduate school who chose to work in community colleges. And actually we have students in our PhD program in history who've chosen to work in places with a higher teaching load in part because that's where they find their purpose. So think a little bit about institutional mission. I wanna bring together some of the things that the both of you have said um, and maybe pose some questions. So Howard, I heard you say that you felt like there were a lot of benefits from working both in an academic world and the policy world you feel like you write more effectively, that you communicate more effectively, especially when there's disagreements, right? Which I think is important. Um, I think that it's pretty clear also as an academic, we know we're all being pushed to do pub what's called public facing work, right? And it sounds like you had a sense of what that looked like. Um, Nick, I heard you say that you did some publishing of policy type pieces of op-eds and blogs before you finished your PhD. So it sounds like you were both preparing in some ways while you were doing your PhDs for both types of careers, right? You both characterized it as a little bit of like, you think it took away from your PhD in a little, in some way, right? Um, I guess the next question is, is it possible to write a PhD that's kind of good for an academic profile and suits a policy profile? I mean, you you both framed it in time, but I guess as in terms of time, right? That that you needed yeah. to... Um... I, I think that there are, I think that one could, one can choose topics that are more policy salient than others. I mean, uh, some of that sort of uh, how events unfold while you're writing, right? Uh, a dissertation, however effic efficient you might be, it takes a long time by the uh, in terms of sort of politics. But but certainly, you know, one that has to do with uh, say corruption or uh, you know um, uh, or natural resources is, is likely to be more translatable than 
than uh, something that's, you know, sort of maybe in the cultural vein. Um, I, I guess I want I want to uh, disagree slightly with with something you said. We, I mean, yes, our institutions love for us to to uh, have a public face, and and um, I, I I know that my university is delighted when I when I get quoted somewhere, but um, I'm not sure that the um, the uh, promotion and tenure committee cares as much about that. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I think so. In other words, I think, yes, we get this sort of institutional pressure, but I think that our our actual rewards in terms of uh, promotion and becoming full professors, it's not necessarily the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would agree with you there. I think that's absolutely right. Um, yeah. Um, so what was your dissertation on? Then? So my it feels very sort of <laughs> late 90s, early 2000s to say, but I was uh, interested. It was on ethnic cleansing and uh, uh, homogenization programs in, in the, uh, the early republic. Uh, so, so, you know, um, I, I grew up during sort of watching the, the breakup of Yugoslavia and the Civil War, and, and I think that that sort of experience uh, really colored uh, my, my academic interests uh, it, it, and continued to color my academic interests to this day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Nick, how about you? Because you sort of started by saying, I mean, you raised this question of writing a PhD that that is good for policy jobs. So how did you how did you come to that as a PhD student? Like, at what moment did you think, oh, I, you know, I want to think of this topic? And, and what did you write about? No, so that's a good, I mean, I didn't even get into this in that, right, the actual choice of topic does play a role. And I think there are even trade offs there. I mean, as Howard said, yeah, at the end of the day, if you're interested in policy jobs, something that's 19th or 20th century, and something that in some ways engages with diplomacy and with kind of state sort of traditional politics. And it can engage with those very critically. It can engage with those bringing in a lot of other perspectives. I think all that's fine, but you sort of do, you would benefit from engaging with those topics in trying to promote, in trying to use your PhD and your PhD research to be, um, to get a policy job. But I even I think it's less that I think it's less the topic of the PhD than just you know is a I mean, the time issue and that you know with limited time it's just the effort the time that would go into making a PhD as good as possible whatever the topic is going to be time that you know you can't use to do other things which you know are necessary or very helpful to make you competitive for policy jobs. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so we do have a question from Leslie Shoemaker. Uh, did either of you have a mentor within academia that you looked to during your graduate career who encouraged you in your interest in opportunities outside of academia? Alternatively, did you have a mentor outside of academia who helped you navigate the policy world? If so, what did you learn from them? Nick, do you want to start? Oh, sure. Yeah, I did not. I had a lot of great mentors in academia who were wonderful in supporting my academic work and who made my research and my PhD possible. I do not think any of them, you know, there was sort of no crossover there. I'm yeah. not sure they were much. Um, I mean, they weren't. It's not like they were against it. They weren't hostile. They, they thought it was cool, but they just didn't have much to contribute in terms of the non-academic job search. Um, but, you know, again, through kind of networking and having been in DC and having met a lot of people, um, you know, there were some wonderful folks in Washington. I, Howard is friends with a lot of them too. I mean, Stephen Cook, Alan Makovsky, Umbudin Zaman, you know, people who were interested in what I was doing as a historian and went out of their way, you know, and two of them, I think, were people who started in academia and made the transition themselves. Um, yeah, Alan was, know, was a PhD student. Yeah, um, and he I got a great job before he even finished his PhD and has had a wonderful career without um, actually finishing. But yeah, so I would, I mean, there were people like that who were wonderful and who, you know, 
in very concrete ways in terms of, I mean, Alan literally introduced me to the person who gave me my first job, but also just in the sense of encouragement of convincing me that, you know, the stuff I was interested in, the stuff I was saying, the stuff I was writing was of interest in kind of promoting that work and encouraging me. Um, yeah, those are the people that in the policy world, at least I feel a real debt to. Yeah. yeah so, so I have to say, um, I think that that the the interest of my academic advisors in my policy stuff was ranged from zero to something negative uh, because it was it was a distraction, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it, it was time away from turning in dissertation chapters. Um, and uh, in, in contrast, I mean, so so uh, uh, he, he recently passed, but Bill Jones, uh, who was the, the head of the, the uh, Turkey program for Amnesty, uh, former State Department official and, and actually a, a scholar in his own right, um, uh, you know, would take me around uh, Washington and, and meet, you know, people both in, uh, in sort of think tanks and, and in, in government. Um, I, my, my, my experience of, um, of the think tank world as, as somebody who sort of comes in on an irregular basis has been that it is profoundly welcoming, uh, at least in, in, in the circle of Turkey experts, um, that it is, has been exceptionally generous. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that it's, it's a different world, right? I, it's, it's always struck me. It's always that, that, you know, sort of one of the greatest historians of uh, the late Turkish Republic in academia, um, somebody like uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Hasan Kayala in, in 19th century or Rishad Kasaba uh, in Seattle, Nobody in policy knows who these people are. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I mean, these these are giants in the field, but but they're not they're not generally known. Um, and you know, um, it's I think that that it takes that step of making it accessible and you know making it more directed to policy to to sort of get heard. Um, I, I think the two worlds don't interact nearly as much as as they could or should. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Uh, I think this leads actually from from a little bit of the previous question. That's for you, Howard. Um, why did Dr. Eisenstadt decide decide to pursue a career in the academy in twenty seventeen? Um, and then the next question is. Uh, actually, why don't you answer that, Howard, and then I'll ask you the next one. Well, um, I mean, so I, I had already, I was already uh, on a tenure role. I didn't stop, uh, I didn't stop my academic career. Uh, I was running, I was doing uh, the stuff on human rights and democratization issues uh, sort of alongside that, um, uh, you know, spare time isn't quite the right word for a junior faculty member, but, you know, making compromises because I thought it was important. Um, the, uh, I, I think there was a, there's a point where um, I might have made the, the leap, but uh, the, the truth is that um, the truth is that as, as we're moving from the early 2000s to 2015, 2016, I actually feel, felt like I had less to say. I, I mean, I initially was in, engaging in policy debates because I felt like human rights wasn't on people's agenda, that, that it was, you know, discussions about Turkey were being framed in sort of tired binaries and that it was important to, to, to intervene. Um, I don't feel that way today. I, I, you know, I, I, I kind of feel like it, in, in marked contrast to a decade or a decade and a half ago, I feel like, you know, 
there's there's really valuable debates about Turkey that are running just fine without me. Yeah. Um, and and you know part of that's a lot of new people who've come up in the intervening years. Uh, you know, Turkish studies went from being pretty marginal, peripheral to to being more important to to and and part of it's that that simply you know. Um, events helped shape people's thinking and uh, shape debates in ways that that I think are are um, salutary. Gosh, that's great. Well, that's a huge success. It feels like, right? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I can actually take credit, but no. I, well, I, I mean, like, I, I, but I feel I, like uh, I feel like things have have moved, maybe not in a great direction in Turkey, but uh, in a better direction about Turkey. Yeah, but that's. That's a historian's response, right? The, the context shifted. And so your relationship to the policy part of it shifted. Um, uh, I think this builds on Leslie's question. So it, even though it's a little out of order, I'm gonna ask it. Um, uh, Nick, maybe you can respond to it. To what extent were you honest with your committee about being interested in non-academic jobs? Um, how does that change depending on where you are in the program? Yeah, I, mean, I know people have had issues with this um, and have had different experiences with their committees. As I said, I was lucky in that I certainly never felt any negativity from my advisors about that. Um, you know, and I was genuinely interested when I finished my PhD in academic jobs. I was applying for them. I was, you know, eager to have their support in applying for them. Um, you know, and so in that sense, I never felt like I had to be dishonest at all. You know, I do, if I'd been sort of more, you know, again, if I'd been able to put in more work on the kinds of stuff that would have made me competitive in an academic job search, if I'd been more enthusiastic about that, if I'd been more kind of plugged in and committed to that whole sort of um, trajectory, I, you know, I, that may have worn off on my advisors. They may have kind of been invested in my you know, career in a way that, you know, maybe they weren't quite as invested, but I, I mean, I don't want to say that in a way that sounds unfair to them. They were very supportive and very, you know, wrote me good letters and, you know, it wasn't, wasn't their lack of enthusiasm that was the issue. Um, but it, yeah, that's the only thing I can think of that maybe, you know, had I been more enthusiastic about really more focused on the academic side of things that may have, you know, had some kind of incidental or secondary benefits in the search process. Mm, that's great. Well, that's helpful. Um, so uh, I have, we have a number of questions. Let me put a few together uh, and then either of you can, can take it. So uh, one question is, how can you prepare yourself for an NGO job as a PhD student? And is, are there particular things, you know, you have a sense of? Um, and then uh, I guess the next one is, can you talk a bit more about what freelancing looks like and the pros and cons of doing that? Um, this person's wondering about how to make the call about whether certain freelance jobs are worth the time, especially if it's hard to say if they will eventually translate to a more permanent position. And so those are two slightly different questions, but mm. maybe, um, I mean, I think they both relate to preparing yourself, right? I mean, speaking from my own experience, I think that um, I think that you have to believe in the mission. Uh, I, I I think that you know, if by by any, I, I mean, I I put in, you know, ten to twenty hours a week working for Amnesty for no pay for over a decade. Wow, that was not a profession, a, a wise professional move. Right, I, I, you know, I'm not sure that my dissertation advisor would have been pleased if during my, he knew that during my research time I was taking a day out of my work week and working with refugees. Uh, I mean, I did it because I thought it was important, and I think that you know, particularly when we're talking about NGOs, I think that you know, if if you if you believe in their mission then you know you're probably a good candidate and the time is well spent and if you aren't committed enough to their mission 
to devote time to it, then you're probably a, a bad candidate. And in any case, getting any job is a long shot. Um, I will say that, you know, sort of there are basic skills like learning Excel and, and, and uh, you know, having office experience and, and honing one's writing skills uh, so that, that one is, you know, sharp and succinct and can, can say things in 500 words rather than 20,000. All, all of those are are probably just good work work things. Work but, habits, yeah. But um, I don't think that my experience is um, a great example of careerism. Yeah. Nick, did you have thoughts about that? No, I think that very much gets to the challenge of all this is that, you know, one of the ways to be competitive and get into, you know, the NGO world and be competitive for an NGO job is by spending a lot of time volunteering at an NGO. Um, one of the ways, you know, to get into a lot of policy jobs is by writing a lot of stuff on a freelance basis for really nowhere near enough money. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, if you have a real job and you're doing the kind of, you know, writing for someone like foreign affairs or foreign policy, as part of that, the extra money is nice, but it's obviously not enough money just purely kind of on its own for the amount of work that writing those articles takes to be in any case in any way worth it. Um, you know, much less, I mean, I think there are a lot of opportunities, you know, various think tanks, if you're willing to write something, you know, longer, a couple thousand words for a fairly nominal fee, uh, a lot of think tanks will be excited about that. It'll give you an opportunity to publish. That can be a very useful professional experience. Um, but again, I mean, you're sinking a lot of time into these things in the hopes that it will pay off, you know, down the line, um, which, you know, is a risk. I, it's not, I mean, it's a different risk from academia. It's sinking, you know, however much time goes into writing a book because you think that's somehow going to help you professionally is it? you know, it's also a bit of a gamble. So I don't, I think the system is actually the same and there are deep systemic problems with that, the fact that that's the way it works. But at the end of the day, you know, for either policy or academia, it's doing a lot of unpaid labor and hoping it somehow pays off. Um, and that's, you know, that's where the prioritization occurs. That's where the, you know, choice occurs and that's where the risk and the misery occurs. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would just, you know, to, to circle back to the freelancing thing, in my experience, you know, and I've been paid for some things and not paid for others. Um, I think that that effectively, the pay works out to being an honorarium. Um, I, I mean, you, you couldn't possibly write efficiently enough for the amount of work that goes into a policy paper for a serious thing. Think. You couldn't possibly write efficiently enough and go through, you know, the the many layers of editing uh, that uh, that to make it pay off. Um, it's and so so I, I think if you're if you're thinking of it as a sort of a revenue stream, I, I I don't think it's a good good choice at all. Well, actually, on that we have a question, and um, and I think this is an important question for a lot of folks, right? How does one manage the financial aspect of otherwise non-lucrative but important things like networking, volunteer work, or writing op-eds, especially when coming from a lower income background? Um, in other words, how does one pay the bills? Um, so, I mean, I have a few thoughts, but maybe you, you two go for it. Uh, I mean, I'll be honest, uh, I, I did it through FLAS. I did it through, you know, through through uh, the the array of, of grants that one gets as a graduate student uh, in uh, in academia, but it's it's um, you know to to do an unpaid internship, you know it's 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 the sort of thing that I think you know um, at the undergraduate level, my university uh, gives uh, internship fellowships for undergraduates to do unpaid internships to help them professionally. I, I think it's something that graduate schools might want to start thinking about if they're, if they're you know, thinking about uh, how, do we, how do we help our students get jobs outside of academia as well as inside of academia. That would be, that would be a useful thing to do. But um, you know, I think the question 
is 100% on target. Uh, the, uh, a lot of this assumes that you're making money elsewhere. I was getting jobs as a visiting professor and, and uh, lecturer and things like that that allowed me to, to sort of uh, make ends meet while I was doing this. But it's, it's, um, it, it, all of that carries the same dangers that, that taking, you know, uh, part-time academic jobs does and the, the dangers of, of falling into the adjunct track. Yeah, me too. But I, maybe that puts a sharper point on what I was trying to say at the beginning, which is do this while you're finishing your PhD. Do this while you have a stipend. Do this while you're getting paid by your institution. And at the point where you have however many years of funding, you know, you can spend those writing a PhD for which you will get paid nothing and hope to use to get a job. Or you can use that writing op eds, which you will get paid a pittance, but also can, you know, with the same sort of odds, if that's the direction you're going, hopefully use to get a job. So in a way, it's, you know, it's the sort of, it's the same gamble. I feel like you have a certain amount of time, you have a certain amount of stipend. Um, if you're interested in, this is what I'm trying to say, if you're interested in the policy track, don't wait till you finish your PhD or unemployed or marginally employed for a year trying to be an academic and then decide, oh, I want to do this other thing. And then maybe you wait two years for the State Department gig to go through, then maybe you're unemployed for another year and a half while you wait for something else to come through. And at the end, you know, that, that stuff comes through and people eventually in Washington find really cool stuff. But, you know, again, if you wait till you finish your PhD and realize you're not gonna get an academic job to start that process, that's an extra two years of unemployment instead of starting it. I mean, I think if you were really sort of savvy, I think what you'd do is start a PhD program, get your terminal masters in two years, get your funding for comps, don't apply for any grants, don't read any of your comp books, just take that money and have a year to actually use your terminal masters that you got and try to get the uh, actual job. I mean, but that's, no one's gonna take that advice. Well, actually, but I think the thing that I hear you both saying, right, is choose your outcome rather than make this a plan B, right? Yeah, I, that, I think, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> I, I think I think that the the idea that that a job at a think tank or at an NGO is um, a lesser job or you know a, a safety school yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> is, is, is a little fanciful and and like you know scoring a job scoring a job like a a, a long term job at a think tank is the equivalent of, of getting a job in Ivy League, right? It's, that's, that's the level of competition. Um, I think that, that um, most, most of the people who get policy jobs aren't going to be at think tanks. They're going to be working for the government or working for a uh, NGO that engages with the government. And, you know, um, they have their own sort of institutional needs that, that you know, the PhD is nice there, uh, but it's 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 really frosting on a cake. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but I think that's a good way to say it, right? Is that these jobs are hard to get, and to to keep in mind that um, that nobody in any job wants to feel like you were their Plan B, right? And I think it's really important to embrace the possibility. Um, uh, so we have a question actually about, and I think Nick, you kind of started to touch on it. A lot of folks are international students, right? Whose who's permission to work in the US changes when you leave. Um, do either of you know if being a non-American with no green card affects the chances of joining the policy world? I mean, it's a clear, I mean, obviously there's an entire set of jobs that you have to be a US citizen for, and that's you know, by no means all of them, but a fair number, um, you know, not even to mention the set of jobs that you have to get a security clearance for, which if you come from an overseas background, if you have family overseas, does become a lot more complicated. Um, so that's certainly true. You, yeah, I mean, and this is where the one situation where I do think people's advisors and their advisors' attitudes 
towards the kind of jobs they're applying for and their advisor's willingness to kind of help them manage some of the final stages of completing their PhD and when they officially finish and when they officially defend in a way that maximizes their ability to use the visa uh, that they have and the time that they have becomes really important. Um, and I've heard stories of people's advisors have been very sympathetic and appreciated the challenge that international students in particular face and were able to help manage that process in a way that uh, worked best for them. And I've heard of horror stories of people whose, whose advisors um, despite nominally being politically on board with this kind of thing and supposedly having good values were terrible and screwed people over and I'm still angry thinking about it. So, you know, it's, yeah, that, that is a situation where being attuned to it and trying to get your, um, your committee and your advisors to be attuned to it is really important. I mean, yeah. it, 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 makes, it makes a tenuous path all the more tenuous. Right. It, it's yes. Uh, Nick and I both know people who who've succeeded in in working as as not U.S. citizens, but but uh, it's it has a lot of challenges on top of an already challenging market. Yeah, yeah. Well, then all the more important to get started early while you still have the support and funding of a graduate program. Uh, um, the next question from John Tracy is looking at certain think tanks, it seems that many, if not most of the members either came from government positions or also working in journalism or academia. Is this the normal way into think tank or are there other ways into think tank, the kind of think tank universe? Nick, do you, you may have a better uh, beat on this than yeah, I mean, no, those are the two paths, right? Or three, if you count journalism, although I think that's in the minority probably. Um, yeah, there are a lot of people who get go and have careers in government and then transition you know, in various ways over to think tanks. But having a PhD is the other route and that think tanks are the one area where having a PhD is, you know, if you're not coming from the government background really is valuable. And so- And a fair number have done both. It's two different, sorry? A fair number have done both, right? And, a fair and number- I mean, The best case scenario is you actually do and if you have a PhD and then go into government, then you're in a really good position subsequently to be in a PhD. I mean, they, yeah, that's sort of the sweet spot. Um, and a lot, you know, again, there are a lot of people who get PhDs, go into the State Department, have, you know, good, exciting careers in the State Department and are able to do a lot of crossover work precisely because of that uh, background. Yeah, great. Um, question to Nick. Could you please talk of your concrete experiences with the institutes you're listed as associated with? Um, yeah, I mean, they were all, so yeah, I started, I finished my, um, I defended in like uh, December, 2015, I think, um, and got hired a couple months after that at the Bipartisan Policy Center, um, which, you know, again, wasn't a place that had a huge amount of focus on foreign policy, but did, had a turkey program. Um, that actually worked out well because there was, um, you know, it was bipartisan that actually, when I started there, a lot of the people on the foreign policy side were on the right side of the political spectrum. So they actually did want to balance it out. So there was a kind of slot from someone coming from the opposite side of the spectrum. Um, and that's actually, that's where I really became much more convinced of this you know, there were a lot of times where we were actually trying to hire people for slots where we'd get a lot of candidates who were clearly coming from a more conservative background. We'd get a handful of candidates coming from a more, you know, liberal progressive background. And it just, at the end of the day, you know, the, as I, Howard has made this point very articulately in the past, you know, if a lot of the people coming out of academia from the left are more hostile to working in the government, are more hostile to, you know, US foreign policy writ large, aren't publishing in the kinds of uh, places that are read by people who work on foreign policy. The problem is that when you're a bipartisan foreign policy institute like ours was, and you're trying to hire someone, you're gonna have a dozen good conservative candidates and one or two good candidates on the other side. And it's, it was always very discouraging for me as the one who was trying to move the whole organization to the left to not really be able to make the case for a lot of the people that I would have liked to hire. Um, 
anyway, so then, then that organization, you know, by 2018, when bipartisanship had stopped being a thing and a competent US foreign policy had stopped being a thing, they closed our program. Um, and so that's when I ended up working for some of these other places, um, which had been all over the place. I mean, they're all great organizations. Um, German Marshall Fund, in part because it was very active in Turkey. Um, when I was in Turkey, working on turning my dissertation into a book, that was a great place to be affiliated with. Um, now, you know, in part because obviously Greece has is very interested in Turkey. Um, there was a Greek think tank that does, um, you know, does a lot of good work, and I was eager to, you know, was interested in the kind of stuff I did. So it's, you know, it's been kind of all over the place. And as Howard said, I mean, there just, there aren't a lot of think tank jobs and they, some of them are part-time, some of them are more nominal affiliations. Um, and, 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 you know, and funding is an issue. So I mean, as Howard said, there are some places that come with really good kind of locked in funding. Um, and those are, you know, yeah, those are the dream jobs. There are others that, you know, the funding isn't as good. It's a little more temporary. Um, the places with better funding, it also tends to have fewer strings attached. Um, there are, you know, obviously places and people who end up at places, not necessarily by choice where the money is coming from a particular place and that causes problems, um, you know, and people do a better and worse job of negotiating that. And I think, you know, as, as Howard said, there is an understanding that a lot of times you do end up working for institutions that don't necessarily match your views. And there are people, I think you do that in a way that isn't effective and they end up being uh, judged for it and associated with some of the views of the organizations they've worked at. And there are other people that do it, I think both a sort of more honest way and a more sophisticated way and end up working for organizations that aren't necessarily ideal um, but come away from that with the, you know, without people thinking they've been compromised. Um, mm. yeah. This is a very tough path if you don't believe in working with institutions or if you're, 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 you know, if you don't think that a little incremental change is better than no change at all. It's, it's kind of, you're not going to be very happy. Yeah, I think that's probably <laughs> right. Um, I will just tell um, you both talk so eloquently about Turkey. Um, so I work on India and uh, spent a sabbatical year living in Calcutta and doing research. And one of the things that the Calcutta U.S. consulate is known for is it's the place where people go for R and R if they've been stationed in Afghanistan. So I was there in in two thousand eight nine, and there were over four hundred. Uh, State Department employees stationed in various parts of Afghanistan who would, um, they would get six months off and they would spend it in Calcutta, which was considered kind of a little bit, you know, not as stressed out or not as polluted as Delhi, not as uh, stressful and expensive as, as some of the other sites. And one of the interesting things um, I learned was, of course, a lot of these people stationed in Afghanistan were, um, had done degrees in South Asia at institutions that we've all heard of, right? Um, whether they were MA program, MA students or PhD students. And um, and so it was 2008. So actually Barack Obama was elected as, as we were there. And uh, what was very interesting was that the internal data showed that overwhelmingly the State Department is, is liberal or progressive. Um, and that in a lot of... Um, national foreign policy that the State Department employees really depart from U.S. foreign policy. And so I that was like a new thing that I learned, which I had never known before. Um, the would, other thing I'll just say is that the people in the State Department, like one of the the person who's the media person had had trained as a nurse and had worked as a nurse for a number of years. The person who interviewed people um, for their visas had worked as an attorney and actually had worked on domestic violence and had you know a lot of experience, uh, but then decided that she wanted a career change. So super interesting meeting some of these folks because my kids were at school in the consulate and, um, and, and really learning that the State Department wasn't like these blue suits <laughs> with people with earpieces. Uh, 
So, you know, I thought that was kind of, to me, very um, encouraging. And, and just to touch on what Howard just said, I think that's right. These institutions are more complex than you think they are. Okay. And, um, and it's really important to kind of think about what kind of change you want to affect and, and imagine how you might fit into that. My, my sense is that, the, you know, and, and this is maybe even more surprising, that that would also be true for the intelligence agencies. Uh, I, I don't think that that necessarily people who are doing security and intelligence work are necessarily conservative, but there's, there's sort of a different type. There's a small C conservatism, which is, you know, sort of the belief that, that, you know, working for the government can, can be meaningful and, and that like more expertise sort of on the ground is a good thing. And, and those sorts of, of sort of ideas that I, I'm not sure that all of my colleagues in academia would agree with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But I think we, you need to choose. Right. You know, and I, I think that um, if I was going to say if there's one takeaway, it's that um, none of these options are easy or straightforward. Right. That it's really important that you choose and, and take some steps in the direction of building a profile uh, in the direction you'd like. Um, I, so we have about 10 minutes left. We have one question. If we if folks have others, you should pile them into the Q&A. Leslie um, Shoemaker wants to know, in addition to being kind, what would be your top two or three pieces of advice for affecting network, effective networking and policy or in the non-academic knowledge industry in general? For instance, email etiquette, requesting meetings, regist registering interest in working together, et cetera. Um, I'll, I'll start. I, I think that, that um, being professional, uh, in, in, in Washington can be much more formal than academia. Um, I, you know, it's, it's really rare for somebody to, to write to me as anything other than dear Professor Eisenstadt or dear Dr. Eisenstadt. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those titles are, are taken very seriously. Um, I think that maintaining connections is really useful. I look, I, I have, I have students who are now, you know, congressional staffers, and if they need something quick on Turkey, well, you know, I'm the person they know. Um, I, I think that um, it's the one Middle East studies, I, I kind of hate academic conferences. Uh, the one conference that I'll typically go to is the one in DC, uh, so that I can sort of touch base and, and have coffee with people. I will uh, never give up an opportunity to, to go down to DC for just that reason, because there is this community. Um, I do think that social media can be effective, but I think it's really important. I think that you, social media is a skill and you need to, you know, finding a way to be, um, to be sort of pithy enough to, to get attention and productive enough to get the right sort of attention, that's a real talent. And I, 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 I think that um, if, if you're getting into slugfest, you're probably doing more damage than, than, than benefit. Yeah, yeah. You do have to disagree with people. I mean, if you're not making an argument, if you're not staking out a position, if you're not kind of saying something Sure. then I also think that works against you. Or more to the point, then also, why are you doing it? I mean, there's a kind right. of- No, I, but I, I, I think- Intellectual blood feuds, why are you trying to be an intellectual? <laughs> no, I, <laughs> the gift of the magi aspect. I, I think the tone of our, the tone of our social media feeds has, has just been illustrated here. Yeah. I, I think that, um, I think that there's a way to engage with people, disagree with people in productive ways. And there's, a way to be a jerk. Uh, yeah. And I, I don't think that being a jerk is ever in your interest. Right. Yeah, I think that's Howard's right. much better at that. Follow his social media feed for advice on this, not mine. Who is that? Howard, no, Howard's much better than this. Follow him for advice on this. <laughs> Nick's funnier. <laughs> um, I mean, one thing that I hear you both saying actually is play the long game, right? That um, and I think that uh, certainly in social media, but certainly in terms of networking and 
building blocks, right? That, um, you know, that, and I think, you know, I think Howard, you started with be kind, but um, I'll just tell you something that's been a huge win in my life this week, which is um, many, many years ago when I was an assistant professor, you know, I went to a university and I gave a talk and I met some graduate students. And of course, this is how old I am. Some of those graduate students have gone on to other jobs, right, and um, have invited me to do things. And I think that that's so, it's such a nice validation, right, of um, them reaching out to me and me being able to see, yes, of course, I'd love to be able to help. And of course, when I met them many years ago, I didn't have the job that I have now, and I hadn't done very much. And um, so I think that there's, there's some real value in building those networks slowly, not imagining that they're going to quote unquote pay off right away, right? Um, I, I think that there's also real value in the informational interview, which is something that we encourage undergraduates to do and somehow we forget to tell graduate students to do. It's okay to cold call someone and say, I'm really interested in how you got to your position. People really like to share that kind of information. Sure. One of my um, summer jobs as a graduate student was I was a, uh, I worked for one of these executive search firms, what's called a head headhunter, right? And the shtick was I would call up and say, I really would like to know a little bit about how you got your job. So I could vet them to be hunted, for lack of a better word, right? Um, but one thing I wanna end by asking you is, um, given what you know now, right? Uh, in, in the ways that you, do you feel like, do you feel like there's skills that you wish you had cultivated in graduate school, right? And this is like skills and competencies that you wish you had had a better sense of as you ventured out into the workplaces that you're in? I, I think um, academics does not, in my view, necessarily teach you to write well or to speak well. And I, I think those are skills worth developing. Right. Um, uh, but I, I, I think honestly, if I, if I could do it all over again, um, I would have simply been more efficient. Uh, how so? Well, I, 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 um, I went to graduate school, with, I was, you know, I was very idealistic about sort of learning. So I would learn language, I, I studied languages that I wasn't necessarily going to use because I thought it was, you know, sort of part of being a Middle East expert. Um, you know, and, and, and spent a, like a lot of time learning Persian, which I don't use, or Uzbek, which I don't use. Uh, and, and, you know, sort of exploring things and, 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 and um, you know, I, that was certainly enriching. But, um, but I, I think that um, if, if I could do it over again, I would have, I would have been quicker to realize that um, MAs and PhDs, regardless, are professional degrees yeah that they're not uh they're not uh simply you know an expression of intellectual curiosity um and i and I, I was i mean this this is probably obvious to everybody else but it, i was slow to pick it up no i think that's a good thing to say actually touches on the question somebody just posted how advantageous is a law degree sorry. to a career and policy to what extent is it valuable to return to school for a JD, if one already has completed their PhD, I'm not sure that I would do it without sort of knowing in advance what I wanted to accomplish. I know that there was a job with Amnesty that I uh, I would have applied for if I had had a JD because I think a JD is a better preparation. But three years and you know, however many tens of thousands of dollars extra uh, for you know. A percentage chance better at, at a, a job seems like a bad, a bad bet to me. I'd, I mean, I'd be more optimistic that a much higher percentage chance of a much higher paying job. You know, you could finish those three years and still not have a job, or do the JD and finish three years and have a job. Um, that's a separate issue. I would, I echo what Howard said. I think this is a very good point. If there was one lesson I took from this 
you know, going back and doing it again, I think if I'd wanted an academic job and that had really been my focus, I would have treated academia as an institution with its own set of expectations and approached it with the same cynicism that Howard's reminding you, you have to approach institutions in Washington and would have been, again, I said, not tried to treat it as an expression of my own views, but been very attuned to what views I should be articulating in order to maximize my professional opportunities. Um, and in that way, I found policy work very liberating because I actually felt it was less ideologically constraining than academia had been. Um, but I don't know, then I, this is also what the book I ended up writing out of my PhD dissertation is about. So I don't know what the conclusion from all of this is anyways. Yeah, well, I think that's a very good note to end on. Um, uh, really, really fantastic comments. And thank you both for engaging so thoughtfully. Um, I know it's really hard to reflect on your own career path and um, and try to articulate some kind of thoughts for folks who are going through something similar. But I really, really appreciate your honesty, um, your frankness, and, and your professionalism in framing um, some of these thoughts in ways that I hope will be will be helpful for the folks in the audience. I think we can't see anybody in the audience, but I will give you a little hand round of applause. And I see I don't have emoticons on my Zoom webinar either. <laughs> um, but you know which emoticon I would use if I was if I was doing that. Um, thank you again. Uh, thank you to all of you who have joined us. And if you are interested in thinking about uh, post PhD careers, we are hosting a session on Tuesday, December the 7th at 4.30 on careers in academic publishing, if you wanted to join us then. And so add, I, if people have further questions, I'd be thrilled. Feel free to email me, I mean, whether about publishing in various venues or just the process in general, I'm very eager to hear from people. That's great, thank you. Thank you to both of you. Thanks so much, thanks for doing this. Take care, bye-bye. Thank